Hello, this is Fragwar from Teal Street. We're going to go over some parallels between poker and blackjack card counting betting strategy um, with emphasis on some of the statistics and randomness and how it relates to the randomness in the market. And additionally, uh, plus EV strategy and deviations outside of the standard norm. Okay. So, I, back in the day, I was, this was about seven years ago, and I was basically just getting off being a freelance web developer, and I wasn't working at my job anymore, because I got let go, and I was basically unemployed, didn't really have a ton of money, and I had some time in my hands, and I thought, I'm going to be, uh... A poker player and that's how I'm gonna make my money actually I I watched the Staples brothers on YouTube Matt Staples and Jamie Staples they're professional poker players and they they uh, play tournament poker emphasis on tournament poker there's two types of poker really there's tournament which has a completely different strategy from cash game which is just basically you risk all the money well, however money, how much money you want up front, whereas tournament is like more of a survival strategy. And I'm going to talk more about tournament strategy. But let's just start with... Um, so overall, we're going to talk about how all this relates to bet sizing and trading and basically risk-reward. Uh, but first, we're just going to go through straight up talking about some poker, talking about randomness, uh, talking about plus EV strategy and how it affect and how it... Uh, how the curve, your equity curve, goes along with it over time. So let's just start with poker. I just, I think this is really interesting when it comes to cards. I think cards are like, it's just, it's like a very interesting thing when you analyze it from a statistics perspective and just how random cards are. So think about deck of cards, right? So you've got it. There's 52 cards, right? How easy would it be to predict the order of those cards after shuffling it? I'd say it's like pretty much impossible. So if you do the math, I would actually guarantee it's impossible. <laughs> but if you do the math, a deck of cards can have a, a amount of permutations that are a factorial of 52 because there's 52 deck of cards. And to get the amount of permutations or the amount of different combinations... You have to do 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, all the way down to one. And that's how many possibilities there are in a deck of cards, right? So when you shuffle a deck of cards, so what does that end up being? 52 factorial ends up being about one to the 66 power. So that is a one with 66 zeros after it amount of possibilities that you can have after you shuffle a deck of cards. So how big is that number? It's, okay. it's, it's ridiculous when you think about it. It's unfathomable. You can't even imagine it. It is that large. Basically, when you shuffle your cards, it is extremely likely, if not it is more likely than not, a combination of cards that has never existed in the history of every single shuffle of deck of cards in existence. It, the amount of combinations of a deck of cards, right, is larger than the amount of atoms in the un, in this earth. So you take every atom on earth and you just add it up and there's more combinations of deck of cards. That's basically the law of like really, really, really fucking big numbers. So, like, that's very random, right? That's extremely random, the amount of possibilities. It's the definition of random. So how does that relate to the market? Well, you can imagine that the market is kind of like a deck of cards, except the cards are not cards. The cards are like people. And the people are the participants in the market, right? And basically, the market is influenced by how those people behave at this given point. So yesterday... The participants are not the same as the participants in the market today. And today, 
the participants are definitely not the same as the participants three years ago. Completely different people making trades. So there's a way you could think about that. One is like fractals, right? There's a randomness to a market to a degree, whereas the further away from now, the more less it's like the current market conditions because the market conditions are the market participants are different and the news is different and the economy is different and everything is different so where randomness comes in like fractals and stuff like that based on your market participants um if you start looking at fractals from like a year ago they don't really matter <laughs> right cuz you can you can almost safely assume that crypto is so hard and trading is so hard that almost the majority of the people are different that are making the market move around So that's basically randomness, but it's actually eight to the 67, my bad. So it's an eight with 67 zeros after it. So you can also say when it kind of comes to trading, this is, this is a standard deviation chart. This is basically where do the events fall outside of the norm right so basically where this comes into play is when you're trading most of the time the events fall completely within this norm which is within the normal range of deviation but sometimes things fall outside and this is due to the effects of just like randomness right and this is where tail risk comes into play. So tail risk means the tail, these ends, of the standard deviation chart. Just think of this as a pile of possibilities that can happen in the market. And the center area, we'll just use this right now. Let's open the chart. And we'll just discuss tail, tail risk and possibilities. Just think of it as like the amount of possibilities and things that are outside or within the normal market conditions. And we're going to use this as an example. And this is very wishy-washy math. It's directionally correct. We're going to use this pump as an example. All right. This happened yesterday. Can everybody in chat, like, please behave? We're trying to have class here, okay? Tenti and Aruklas are fighting. All right. So let's go and look at this, right? And let's just take this area, and I never really use the rectangle tool, so uh, pardon me if it's messed up. Where is the rectangle tool? Just use the line tool. All right, we're going to really zoom in here, and we're going to look between these. This period, and we're going to look between these orange lines. So just this spot as a sample of possibilities in the market. So you would say, and this is where I'm, I'm going to get into tail risk, basically. If you look at this orange square, most of the events are occurring within this range. So if you go back to the, all the possibilities of these events, they are falling within this 34, this first, this 34th, and this 34th percentile areas, right? So it's all falling within normal range. Well, this is where tail risk comes into play and how it takes basically just one event to basically fuck up your balance. And examples of tail risk are you not protecting yourself in events like a black swan event. So we're going to pretend this like this pump. I think it definitely took out some people out of this competition. Um, but if you were on the right side of it, uh, it was good. And if you're wrong side, it was bad because it was very unpredictable, very fast and very outside the norm. It was so random, right? So we go back to the chart. Everything's happening. This is in with the normal, the normal uh, distribution of possible events. And boom, we get a tail end event, <laughs> a super 
huge 2K pump that happened in one minute, and then a 2K pump dump, 2K dump that happened in another minute. That is very unlikely and has been extremely unlikely. Right? So those events fall into the tail end of 0.1%, 1% possibilities, right? And those are the events that can fuck you up or you can make a shit ton of money off of it, right? So basically, we'll get into bet sizing. The, the most, the, where I'm trying to get with this is taking card strategy, statistics, randomness, and tail events and how to determine how much you should risk in your bet sizing, right? So, what you could determine from this is that you are trading well within the normal means and everything makes sense and one event can either take you out or can pump you up. So let's go back to, let's just go to poker as an example or just start here. And this is not like a definite thing. This is some random website. I just like found this on Google. But it's basically, um, it basically gets the job done. So any questions so far? I'm going to stop for questions and pause. Yes, you could be ace of clubs, Lucardi. But it has to be top of the deck after it's shuffled. And you can be an ace of clubs as long as at that top of the deck after you shuffle. And that's a 8 in 60 to the 67th power chance, basically. Okay, woman in red. Are you just stuck at how large of a possibility stuck in the number thing of how like many possibilities there are it's insane like it's un it's actually like by definition unfathomable you can't imagine something that large you can't put anything you can't take that number like 8 to the 67th power and 8 with 67 zeros after it and you cannot apply any reasonable thing to it that makes it make sense like how many is that what does that look like in pizzas what does that look like in dollars what does that look like in in frogs right it's it's so like they take the the idea of it's more atoms than on earth and that's like the only way you can put any sort of measure to how large that number is it's insane you shuffle a deck of cards and you are holding something that most likely, more often than not, has never existed before. It's insane, really. All right, I'm going to move on. So here we're going to talk about betting now. Now we know about randomness. We know about the distribution of events. And I'm just winging this and you can kind of research this on your own. As like, This is just like a little bit of a starter and in, in way of thinking uh, like statistics in betting and sizing in betting. So we're just going to take this poker strategy here. So I'm not going to go too deep into poker because uh, I don't want to draw us out too much. I want to get to the point of positive expected value, right? But poker is extremely, extremely, extremely similar to trading as far as bet sizing. So here is a chart, and this is like a cheat sheet that somebody made for bet sizing based on the two cards you're holding. So if you get an ace and an ace that is basically a guaranteed good bet but as you get further out to the worst combinations of hands which a seven and a two is pretty much one of the worst combinations of hands you could have in poker you want to very 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 much decrease either a your probability of betting and your size of betting so we're just going to quickly do uh, a strategy here i found this cool website it's got like a deck of cards and we're just going to quickly play around with this strategy in poker called two plus two strategy so i think the colors lucardi 
are just kind of to give you an eyeball of green is good and orange and yellow is okay and these are bad or something. I don't know. But this is just an example saying like the better your hand, the higher you should bet basically. All right, so we got a deck of cards and we're going to just, if you haven't played poker before, um, this might not make sense to you, but I'm going to try to be as simple as possible, right? So, obviously you want the better hand in poker. And you can look up top 10 hands in poker if you haven't played. So we're going to shuffle this deck. Ooh, that's cool. And we're going to draw two cards for myself, okay? So these are my two cards. And it's okay. I have a face card. That's pretty good. Um, they're not the same suit. That's less likely. But we're going to go over what's called 2 plus 2 strategy. And this is kind of like risk reward in trading. So 2 plus 2 strategy tells you the likelihood that you are going to get the card that you need on the next card that turns on the poker table, basically. So we're going to do the flop. And it does a flop, and we do three cards. And that's actually pretty good. So here, and this isn't a poker talk. This is just an example of risk reward, right? So I have a six, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I could have a four or a nine, right? How many, I can't assume anybody has a four or nine. I don't know where the fours and the nines are, but I can safely assume that there are four fours and four nines out there based on the information I know. There's four fours and eight nines, and that would give me a good hand, and that's what I'm looking for is a good hand. That would be a straight. So four plus four is eight, because I have a possibility of eight cards that I want. So I'm gonna open, um, maybe we can overlay numbers when this gets edited, but point being, I need, one of eight cards to make this a really good hand. So yeah, somebody in chat, no for bet me please, knows exactly. There's 52 cards, right? Or um, about, at this point, there's about four, there is 47 possibilities of cards I don't know, which is roughly 50%, of roughly 50, which is easy enough for this math, that's called two plus two. So eight times two, is 16. So there is a 16% chance that this is going to be the card I need to have probably the best hand on the table. Because somebody could have a pair of eights, somebody could have a pair of sevens, fives, two pair, even three, quads, impossible. So let's continue. A 16% chance. This is good. I would bet. Now here's the difference in poker and trading. Unless you are trading extremely huge size, I'm talking 300, 400, 500 Bitcoin size, the difference between poker and trading, and this is why I really think trading is infinitely easier than poker, is that in poker you have to get somebody to call your bet and nobody has to call it. Even if you have the best hand in the world, nobody has to take your bet. But in trading, there's almost there is always someone to take your bet as long as your bet isn't so huge that somebody can't afford it, right? So we're hoping someone takes our bet. This is a plus EV move. 16% chance is pretty good when it comes to the randomness of cards. And plus EV means positive expected value. So what does positive expected value mean? We'll get into it as far as like a chart. But all it means is me betting right now over the long run will have a positive expected value in the growth of my total equity for poker. Okay? And that is when there is enough samples. But we'll get into the sample sizing, the randomness, and the equity curve. Or in poker, they call it your bankroll type thing, right? So let's go. There's a burn card. And then it turns... That doesn't help me. Well, still according to the math, there's a 16% chance. Burn this card. Four. Okay. So I did get a straight. This is, I'm so glad this worked for this example. Me betting had a positive expected value. And even though there's a 16% chance for that to happen, 
16 divided by 100. Well, obviously. I mean, um, uh, how many, why is my brain farting right now? 100 divided by 16, right? Okay, so basically I hit a one in six chance for this, okay? I got a straight and unless somebody, there's no, yeah, I'm looking at the cards there and I'm probably gonna get somebody like in the comments who's like, I could see a better hand, but technically it does not look like Somebody could have a six and a nine. That would beat me. Somebody have a six and a nine, but let's just say I won this hand, okay? So, it was a 16% chance. That's pretty good. So, we put our bet out and we won this hand. Well, I only need to win this hand one in six times for it to be positive expected value, right? Because in theory, over time, I should win this hand one in six times. Unless, and it's, it's a little different. I know the combinations of cards make a difference out here. All over, like, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons. But let's just, for simplicity's sake, me placing a bet had a one in six chance I won. And I should expect that to pay me one in six times over time. So what does that do for positive expected value on your equity curve? over time so i'm gonna get paint out okay we're gonna get some ms paint charts out and this is gonna flash bang you i'm so sorry this is very unprepared so let's just take a chart and uh the bottom axis will be hands trades and this top axis will be um, equity or balance or bankroll. Okay, so we're gonna get this and we're going to start with positive expected value. So right, we expected as long as we're making these good moves, we're making good decisions on our bets, we should expect a positive value over time. Um, First, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this one second. I'm gonna go back and I want to do card counting really quick. I just want to say something really quick about card counting to make sense, make this make a little more sense. So we did poker. My odds of having the best hand, getting the best hand, and how that should pay. I should expect that should pay over a lot of samples of hands. I need to keep playing a lot of hands in order for this to be work out for me. So in card counting, I started watching this guy on YouTube. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but he's a card counter and he's from Britain. He goes to the U S and he counts cards and he gets kicked out of casinos and he makes like YouTube videos. So a card counter is looking for an edge, just like in trading and poker. He is looking for a 51% chance to beat the house. Now do you basically for card counting, all you do is you keep a count of the head, the count of the cards in your head like a score. So you just keep this count, plus six, minus six, and when it's plus six, you bet more, and it's minus six. Yes, Steve Bridges, Lucardi. When it's plus six, you bet more, and when it's minus six, you bet less because that's in your favor. And when it's plus six, it means there's like more likelihood of tens, and if it's minus six, it means there's very little likelihood of tens, and you're probably going to lose. So you're looking for a 51% advantage over the house. We're going to go back to paint and we're going to graph that. So this chart applies to poker. It applies to hands of hands of poker. It applies to hands of blackjack if you're counting cards. And it hands to applies to um, trades over time. So if you are sizing your bets and trading with a positive expected value, here is... the expected value. This is in theory, if you are playing the cards right and you are taking the right bets and you are sizing it right and you're taking the right trades and sizing your trades right, this should be your balance over time. Now, let's get into randomness, right? Of course, you could lose, according to the law, very large numbers and possibilities. You could lose every single hand even though you do a positive expected value. 
Same with every trade. Every trade seems like a given, but you just get screwed by huge dumps or news or pumps or fake news or anything. So I'm going to pause one more minute before I get into this. Does anyone have any questions about poker, randomness, uh, like basically quantifying possibilities in like a, in a bell curve with tail risk like we did? Is this making any sense so far? Is this helping? And this is something like you can look up on your own. Just like look up card counting and try to apply it to betting and trading, you know? Look up um, two plus two strategy. Look up poker tournament strategy. Yeah, right, dude? This is, like, bringing me so far back to when I was, like, trying to get really good at poker. All right, so here's the, here's the kicker. In the long run, it's profitable. In the long run. Not in the short term, not in the midterm, in the long run. As long as you are making the positive expected value moves, you should be having somewhat of a linear growth. And that is because you need more sample sizes. It is so random that you need to just have so many situations where you put yourself in, where you take risk and you expect something out of it or you don't take risk that it has to balance out the randomness. Yeah, Peter, it'll be on YouTube. So this is hands trades. Also, this is time. You know, same thing. Hands trade time going across. You're going through time. You're going through the amount of trades you take. The hands of blackjack, the hands of poker. And here's your equity imbalance, right? So if you are trading well and you're not doing anything stupid, you're not high leverage risking, you're not getting drunk and trading, you're not, you know... I don't know, betting on shit coins, you're just taking smart, high risk reward trades, you should expect, and same with blackjack and same with um, counting cards and, and uh, counting cards and same with poker, you should expect your real balance. So this is the expected balance, EV, and the pink is your real balance. You should expect it to look something like this. real okay so this is a very excellent ms paint drawing you should expect that there's going to be some randomness but as you have more samples it should balance out to the positive expected value equity curve right so you are more likely if you're making plus ev moves you're more likely to be close to that curve or up after 100,000 hands or a million hands versus being up after 100 hands, right? Because statistically, you're making the right moves. You just need to balance out the randomness. So we can do something. We could just talk about some. Okay. So here's the point, right? You need to survive. <laughs> Like, it's that simple. You need to be around when the betting is good, and you need to have money when the betting is good. That's it. I made off of, off of my balance. So I started trading back in, and a lot of people know this story already. So I started trading back in March 2021. I learned from Sam, who, you know, now we're partners at Teal Street. Now uh, I've learned to trade from him. Uh, now I'm doing videos on his channel. So the key is that you need to have money and keep making decent decisions and survive to the points where there are statistically improbable events and you have money to bet on it. Like you bet on a big pump or a big dump or an obvious move. You have the money to do it and you survive long enough to balance out your trading over the course of your career and you have the money to bet. I think it was Salsa Tequila on Twitter that said it this way, he says, you cannot risk, 
your ability to take risk. Because if you can't take risk, you can't make money. Exactly. Do not lose everything is the key. You can't risk everything. So I'll go back and I'll start a little bit about my trading career and like the statistics of all this, right? So I started trading in March of last year and I took it extremely seriously from the beginning. So I'm trading almost all day, every day. I'm trading during my job. I'm almost getting in trouble at my day job because I'm like slacking off because I'm trading so much. And luckily I joined Teal Street and we made it a thing. So now I don't have to worry about trading at work anymore. But point being is I took a lot of trades since March of last year until now. So back in October, I had a really good feel for the market. And after putting in about 33 grand, actually it was after putting in about, after losing about 33 grand since I started from March to October, I had 2K left. And I did, with that 2K, I had a really, really, really good feel for the market. And I took that 2K and in basically four really large swing trades, a short to a long and a short to a long, I took that 2K and I brought it up to 250K. So out of, and big traders will tell you this, it is very few number of your trades will make up your net worth. Extremely few number of trades make up your net worth, right? And you want to look for the ones that are so asymmetric risk, which means the risk is worth the reward or the risk is so small because the re and the reward is so big, like it's a bottoming event or a black swan type event. And those will be the ones that, because you survived, it will make up and boost your equity curve back into the norm over here. And you have to have money to bet on. If you're out of money, you can't make the bets, right? So we can put a little bit of a linear with this in into, um, well, we'll start with tradings, right? So let's recap. The point is you need to survive and you need to have money to take risk. If you don't have money to take risk, you miss the opportunities that could really boost your equity and balance out your, your plus EV equity curve. So I was not, let's go back to poker. And I'm going to like, I know there's going to be people who won't get this and I'll try to explain it without going deeply into poker. Um, but I did not play cash games. So a cash game is what you would, if you don't know poker, it's what you would call going and sitting in a casino and you sit at the table and you have a hundred dollars and everybody can put in an infinite amount of money and everybody at this table in the casino can lose an infinite amount of money. So I didn't play that way. I played what was called uh, tournaments. I played poker tournaments. And poker tournaments are extremely similar to trading because the goal is you don't just want to make money and make plus EV moves. You have to make moves that cause you to survive the tournament. So we'll just do this with, um, we'll just do an example of like a high risk, high reward in a tournament setting. So when you play poker in a tournament, you have something called the small blind and the big blind. And this is basically the tax for playing, right? And everybody once around the table has to pay the pay either the small blind, pay the small blind and the big blind, right? So in a tournament, everybody starts with a thousand chips, for example, and the blinds go up, right? So let's say the blinds start at at five dollars and ten dollars and everybody starts with a thousand can't have more than that at the beginning everyone gets a thousand just like this tournament right everybody can start with 300 so what's the goal here you need to survive and you need to be the last person with all the chips and you need to survive long enough to balance out your equity curve and take enough hands to be able to make bets that are good right because it's so random it's very likely you're, you could get a lot of bad hands during this tournament so here's the catch it's the tax for going around and basically it'll eat you up if you don't play you don't have to bet to play every hand but you have to play the big blind and the small blind so it'll be five and ten right so let's just do the calculator here and people do this count in big blinds they call it how many big blinds you have left right so let's just say you have a thousand and the big blind is ten that means you could survive 1,000 rounds around the table 
of the, the dealer chip going around the table, you could survive a thousand times until you run out of money. And that, in, that assumes you're not making any bets or playing any hands, right? You're folding every hand. So in a tournament, what they do is you don't want this to go on forever. So every five or so rounds around the table, they increase it. So eventually it'll be 10 and 20 and people will have more and more chips and it'll be 30 and the people with less chips will be getting squeezed out of the tournament because they can't afford to be playing anymore, basically. And then 40, 50, 100. So let's just say um, I still have only 1,000 chips and the big blind's 100. And this is a statistically proven profitable move okay in poker so this is a pretty much given poker tournament strategy that most uh tournament poker players will agree with so i have 10 big blinds left that means basically everyone's got a fuck ton of money around me and i can only survive 10 more rounds around the table so that's not very many hands and you can expect it's also going to go up very soon the big blinds so let's just say here, this is a plus EV strategy. It's called um, basically shoving it in if you have any face card and hoping for the best. And statistically over time, even though this seems odd, this is the profitable thing to do when you're in the situation where you can only survive 10 more rotations around the table, blinds are going up, and you are pretty much probably one of the lowest chip stacks in the in the tournament at this point. You need to shove it all in if you get a face card, because statistically it's going to be fairly unlikely that you even get that face card to try to save your butt in this tournament. So we're going to deal my cards. That's not a face card. There we go. This jack two, it's not great, but statistically I should shove all my cards in right now, shove all my chips in right now, hope somebody calls me. Statistically, I might have the best hand and it's probably the only way I could survive. Now this is on a very low level. You can make decisions like I said, like people either can take your bet or not take your bet. And in poker, you can kind of infer what people are trying to say when they put out a certain number of chips. But on a basis level, let's just say this is the statistically significant the statistically most positive expected value move to survive in the tournament shove all the cards in win or lose over time shoving all your chips in at this point will give you um a positive expected value in tournaments over time and basically you need enough chips to survive hopefully you double up and you could survive 20 big blinds now hopefully you triple up you could survive 30 big blinds now and you get more samples okay so that's the same thing with trading so Kaleo, okay. Do you guys know Kaleo? On Twitter? He had a good post about this. Yeah, Crypto Kaleo, yep. He had a good post about his strategy. It's very similar to this. He had a job. He was like a door-to-door, -door, I want to say window salesman. Don't quote me on this. Um, but he had a job and he couldn't trade all day. So what he did was he took his paychecks and he basically put huge high leverage entries in super good super good locations and would wait like weeks right weeks a month for this entry to get filled and he would hope what he would get out of this was a boost in his balance right so that boost he's taking basically a very uh not low risk but high r trade in order to um in order to optimize his chances of multiplying his balance so he could take less risk with because he'll have more money that he could play with okay so i'm gonna pause again um i'm basically at this point i'm going to be done talking about cards i'm gonna be done talking about poker um and blackjack so the point is there's a mathematically uh, optimized way to play poker and you should bet bigger when the odds are in your advantage and there's a mathematically uh, high probable positive expected value way to play blackjack and you should be um, betting more when it's in your advantage so over time your equity curve uh, can uh, smooth out the randomness and you will have a positive increase over time as long as you are literally and this is this is a big part of it you are literally making the right decisions 
almost all the time, at least as far as like a betting strategy. It doesn't have to be trades correct on trades, but if you are correct on sizing, it's going to be good over time. Okay. Questions about any of that? Is this helping at all? Is it, am I repeating things that people already know? Um, is it making sense? I'm kind of just rambling like I usually do. And like I said, dude, like, look this up. I have a book right on my desk over here. The Psychology of Poker, Alan N. Shoemaker. Some of you know this book who played poker, right? This is all thinking strategy, betting strategy, you know? You're in a battle with yourself when you're trading. In poker, you're also in a battle with other players, but it's mostly a battle with yourself, right? You're trading against yourself. You're, you're the one fucking up your balance. You're the one making bad decisions, you know? Yeah, Peter, you're like against your ego. You try to like, you, I mean, I'm not gonna get into it too much, but stoicism is like a, Lucardi, we talk about this sometimes, but it's a type of philosophy where, um, you can look this up, this is stoicism with a capital S, uh, and I applied a lot to this and it's very good for poker and betting and business and all sorts of stuff. It's a very practical philosophy, but uh, Stoicism with a capital S because back in uh, Rome, they used to talk about philosophy on the Stoa, which was the porch, and they would go there and they would talk and that became Stoicism. But the point is um, you have certain things that are within your control and th certain things that are not in your control. And you can't worry about the things that aren't in your control. And you can completely worry about all you want, the things that are within your control, right? So what do you have in your control when playing poker, blackjack, uh, or trading, right? You have your bet sizing, you have your entries, you have whether to fold, you have, um, you know, uh, how much to bet for this particular count in counting cards. Uh, what do you have not in your control now? You don't have control of the randomness of the deck. You don't have control if the dealer kicks you out of the casino and you get pretty much beat up in the back of the casino for counting cards, right? You don't control you got 40 bad hands in a row in poker. Uh, you don't control that the market um, missed your entries, right? But you do control how you react to that, how, if you're going to let that affect you or not. And you do control how you play from there on out. So... Uh, I'm going to continue and we're going to go into, um, I think we're just going to go into, what do I want to do now? We'll just do risk plus EV moves and I'll talk a bit about risk profile and I'll talk a bit about uh, tournament, uh, basically for this tournament. No, I only got nuked on one account, actually. I basically waited for an entry for like three days to get this balance. So we're in a tournament. Uh, we'll talk about risk and reward and we'll talk about risk profile and we'll talk about uh, tournament trading now. So Let's just do uh, R. So the risk profile in Teal Street, if you haven't seen it, it's under your settings and you might have to turn it on depending on when you're watching this video. And we are going to look at some high risk, high reward setups, right? I don't know who real Fragor is. Somebody's like fucking around basically and like fucking with me. It has been driving me crazy, but I'm glad I'm like beating him now. Uh, let's just say this spot here. Um, we just use this as an example.
Okay, this was basically a real trade I did. And this is like how I started my net worth, right? So, um, this was a real trade. And this is how I started my net worth. We'll use it as an example. And we'll use it uh, in a sense of um, risk and reward and, and how I should expect this to pay off in the long run. So, uh, I long this area. And there was some um, Bitcoin CFD news going on and things like that. And it looked very bullish at the time. And I said, uh, if this was a bounce, I could expect a move similar to this move where it went up 83%. And it did go up about 60%. And I just bet all the way up. And I got very lucky because I also did not get punished. Because you can see we did not really punish longs at all throughout this whole pump up. So, okay. Not the point. It is a 6R trade. So what does that mean? Well, that's a mighty fine example because uh, we were playing that game and we had a straight and we were playing poker. And it had a 16% chance that I got the card I needed and I got the card. Um, so that was a one in six chance, right? So that's also exactly the same thing as a six R trade. I have, I'm risking one to gain six, right? So uh, based on my entry here at this significant level, I set a stop loss and I have a potential to catch a bottom in theory, like this is just an example. And it's a six R trade. So just like in poker, what does that mean? I only need to be right one in six times for this to break even. That's the important thing. I want to say it again. I only need to be right one in six times for this to break even. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means the higher the R... I could basically delegate how much I think it's worth risking. So I could, in theory, risk one-sixth of my balance on trades like this and expect in the long run to break even or be profitable if I'm slightly ahead of the curve, right? So you don't want to do that because you want to survive, so you want to do less. But basically the point here is when it is a higher return on your risk, you want to usually bet more money. And that goes for the same fact of tight stops and things of that sort. You can also use this. Like this could be tight entries. Too. Like you can go for tight entries on levels and trade between levels. And still get like a 5R, and that's like pretty good. So you basically need to determine how valuable that is to you, how much of your balance you want to risk on it, and that's basically that. Betting is better, so you should bet a little bigger. But in like a, a 3R trade, whereas like, or a 2R trade, or a 1R trade, This is not good to get a one-to-one. -one. You have a one risk for a one reward. That is not good at all, and you should not even take the bet. In theory, you should be looking for at least a three-to-one return on most of your trades. Okay. So basically, you're taking good trades, and you're betting more when there's a higher probability of, like, you not having to be right very often um, in order for it to pay off. Like a 10R trade, it's 10 risk, one re or, uh, 10 reward, one risk. That's 10%. You only need a 10% chance for it to work out for you to break even. So one in 10 times, you'll break even. If you're making good trades and you're looking at TA and you're looking at price action and you're you know hitting them, 
That's where like the statistics kind of escapes trading because you can kind of have some sort of prediction, right? But as far as the statistics and just plain old coin flips and black and white betting, uh, you can reduce your losses by making your bets um, size a certain way based on Sell your 16. risk uh, and reward ratio. So a 10%, a 1 in 10 chance is all you need. You take 10 of them, you win 2 of them, that's really good. You win 3 out of 10, that's extremely good. But you only need to win 1 to break even. Considering you're making the same bet sizes. Again, this is kind of like wishy-washy math, but I think it gets the point across. I think I think I hope this might make it a little more clear um, when it comes to these these 10 R trades where you need a one in 10 chance. So obviously you want to be taking good trades, but this is literally statistically and bet sizing related when you talk about risk and reward, right? It is basically a one in 10 chance means to break even you need to just flip heads one out of 10 times. So that's a 10 R trade. Uh, we're just going to go Google. Uh, one second, I'm afraid my okay so we're starting fresh um imagine obviously you're taking good entries uh, but this is about your bet sizing right so if you're taking a 10r trade 10 times you only have to be right once to break even so what is that really and and just that's essentially a flip of a coin you need to flip heads once out of 10 times um you need to be right once out of 10 times on this specific trade when it's a 10r trade right Okay, so let's flip a coin and try to get a heads and see how many heads we get in 10 times. Zero. It's one heads. Two heads. Three heads, four heads, four heads, four out of 10 heads, right? So you took the right play you risked accordingly. Um, you had a, a, a 10 to one risk on your return. Um, or you had a 10 to one return on your risk. So you just made four to one uh, return on your risk because you sized accordingly for this type of bet and you really only needed to be right once but you were right four times all right let's do this again with a 2r trade right a 2r trade means you are risking uh <laughs> one one dollar to win two dollars basically right and you need to be right uh one in two times for this to be profitable or to break even are you ready? We're going to do heads again. We're going to try to go for heads. One. Two. All right. Well, that was a shitty trade. And I am so, so glad the universe and mother of randomness was on my side to make this a really good example. But um, basically, that's... A, sucks and that's a, a pretty expected result is to to get um not hit a coin flip out of two tries right and you could do the same thing so you want to take trades that are high reward for risk because it kind of buffers out the amount of times you need to be right um and you should have an exp a positive expected value curve over time as long as you're taking positive expected value trades and betting accordingly All right, let's just talk. I'm going to give a little a little uh, talk about the tournament now. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, so we have this tournament. It's a Teal Street tournament. It's officially hosted on Bybit. Um, Teal.link slash compete is the URL. Uh, this goes on for another 11 days. And it ends on the 28th of March, 2022, I believe. Um, so uh, 
the point of this tournament, you start, you don't have to start with 300, but the minimum buy-in is $300, right? And you win by having the highest percent P&L gain. So what do you want to look for then, right? Well, if it's $300, and this is just specific things you should look for maybe in this tournament, um, and you want to look for percent gains, well, a 1% gain on $300 is a $3 profit. So if you make a $3 profit, you will have 1% P&L in this tournament. And irrelevant of your balance size, $3 is still 1%. By 23.61. So, what's 10%? That's a better gain. What's 100%? What's 30%? So if you're using something like risk profile, which, uh, exclamation point, risk profile, you can basically set up your entries to, uh, to have a, a good return on your trades and try to take profits quickly that will help you boost your percent gain in the tournament. So let's just uh, open a trade and it's kind of, I feel a little nervous because this is my actual competition account, but uh, we'll just do a small 1x trade to just use an example of this risk profile. I'm gonna clear all my orders. It makes things simple. Watch it nuke on me. All right, so, wait, where's my other stop loss? Okay. We're just gonna enter a small 1x trade. For sake of example, we're gonna turn reduce only off. Wait for this to fill. Uh, promo is buy bet. All right, you could fill me now, market maker that's watching the stream. All right, I'm filled. So, uh, what matters in this tournament? Uh, you can watch the risk profile video. I'm not going to make a big uh, fuss about it, but I'm just going to give you a strategy on how to use it. I just have a 0 0.05 long I'm in, so now I'm going to... Do a 0 0.05. Oh, this is a 2x actually. Um, a 0 0.05 profit take. And I'm going to look at risk profile, right? So all I'm doing, I'm looking for these, these three. Th in my opinion right now, I'm looking for $30 moves. I want to try to get 30 moves in $30 increments because that's 10% boost on my balance. So I could see this on the chart. So this is a, a pretty bad example, but if I was 10x, this would be a little easier. Uh, so... I can move my sell order up. And where's the thing? PL. Okay. So, what matters in this tournament? I mean, unrealized PL shows up on the high scores, but really matters is how much you realize in the end. And the higher your balance, the less risk you can take to get bigger gains. Like, for instance, since my balance is a thousand bucks now, and somebody starting out's balance is $300, um, they have to use, we'll get the calculator out again, uh, 1,000 divided by 300, oh, I fucked up. 1,000 divided by 300. They have to use 3.3 times more leverage than me to get the same result. So I can risk less because I'm boosted my balance and I don't want to risk any more because this balance is a huge key asset to my, my ability to compete right now. Uh, so... I want to look for a move. I could use risk profile. You want to use static mode. Static mode means that uh, the PL is based on your entry. Okay? So right now, my entry is 41,145. And like I said, this is a, you can go through a whole video and a whole doc on this. Um, uh, Lat will put it in the YouTube description. And uh, you could see that. At the current last price, I'm down $2.70, which in my mind, I quickly go, okay, that's 1% in the tournament. And if I get to this take profit up at the top, that's a $30 realized profit gain, and that's 10% in the competition. So like that's, I mean, that's pretty good for me, but I'm trying to get those moves very quickly at this point 
and just snatch these these extra 10 percent that are a lot less risky for me now that i've gotten a boost um and a little more risky and harder for other people who have to use higher leverage so my strategy i'll start from the beginning on how i got here i guess i waited basically like two or three days for a really 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 high positive expected value good entry level and very little um, space for invalidation below the entry in order to use an extreme amount of leverage and hopefully swing swing my balance up extremely high so I could start trading with a little less risk. So it's risking on in the beginning and it's risking off while you have the balance. So basically my entry was, uh, which for this example, it was like about here and I almost got liquidated by $100 because I was 60x leverage, but I caught this long and I shorted it and I had like a 320% and then I nuked on, got nuked on and I had about 160% balance. But point being, my strategy, and I think it's a really effective strategy for this tournament is uh, either you have to survive. There's going to be people in the top 10, including myself, that may not be there at the end of the tournament. And you have to... Um, if you want to get a little more playing time with lower leverage, you want to try to get a boost and then start doing like 5, 10, 15, 20x leverage. So that's it. I think it's a good, uh, fair strategy is looking for these. Uh, after you get some sort of thing, look for like gains within $3 increments. And you know in your head... Um, and you know what's on the table, too. I wish this was in profit so I could give another example. But that's through the randomness of the market, right? Um, but basically, you could see, like, the this is the inverse, but um, what I currently have taken off the table and I need to retrace to my entry to get is a 1% gain. So dynamic mode inverse profile does your P&L based on your on last price and static does based on entry. And that's the only difference between static and dynamic mode. And you could hover all these columns to figure out what they do as well. I'm going to close this before I mess up my tournament balance and also try to not pay a fee. Because the fees will kill you in here too because you're on high leverage. All right, any questions about tournament strategy, um, what to look for in your risk? You want to be taking money off the table if you've got it, um, because the more money you have, the more power you have to take less risk than other people, basically. It's just like the Kaleo strategy. Basically, what he did was he was had a day job. He couldn't trade all day, and he looked for these super asymmetric entries that are super far out of range and at big levels um and you would hit them and eventually he hit enough of them to the point he could start taking less leverage and tone down everything and be able to trade as his his main job that's not, obviously too this is not the only strategy for a tournament this is just like what i'm it's just like with the poker, right? Um, if it's like getting near the end of the tournament, just like it's getting near 10 big blinds, right? 10 big blinds left in poker, that's bad. You need to shove it all in. If it's getting near the end of the tournament, you need to start risking on. I mean, that's just the way it is. Or you, there's very little chance you'll win because you don't have enough time to average out the randomness. Okay, if there's any questions, I think I'm just going to stop it there. Uh, this was, if you're watching this on YouTube, this was a live stream. Uh, we're going to put some links in the description. We're going to put some uh, links to the competition, uh, links to Risk Profile, which is a tool that you could use to manage your risk and to see what your pot profit is and kind of design your trades. Um, I'll put some other links for poker strategy and card counting strategy and basically you can determine how that applies to trading that's it any questions
All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. Good luck.